Welcome to Somerville Live Wire. I'm Mary Ellen Muir. Somerville Live Wire is a bi weekly program covering local issues sponsored by the Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism in partnership with the Somerville Media Center. Live Wire is part of the Somerville News Garden, a grassroots effort to stop Somerville from turning into a news desert. Check out somervillewire.news for news about Somerville. Today, we're going to talk about the crisis in policing. The, cr the topic is on the table. Yes, there are the thin blue liners who defend the police against all criticism, but the Black Lives Matter movement gained traction last summer and continues to have momentum. The question is, what to do? Reform the police? Defund the police? What is Somerville doing and what would be an ideal public safety model? What would it look like in Somerville? To discuss these issues, we're joined by two Somervillians, Benjamin Echevarria, Executive Director of the Welcome Project, and Matthew Kennedy, co-founder of Defund SPD. The Welcome Project is dedicated to building the collective power of immigrants to shape community decisions. Ben is a pastor, serves as a trustee for Cambridge Health Alliance, as treasurer for Community Works, and co-chair of Tisch College Research Center at Tufts University, and his leadership has been recognized by the State House of Representatives and other organizations. Ben, thank you for joining us. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Defund SPD is an organization led by people of color that aims to reallocate funding away from policing and toward life-affirming services such as housing, healthcare, and food security, over the past year, the group has organized thousands of supporters to petition, email, and testify before the city council in demand of a budget that more accurately reflects the needs of residents. Matthew has written columns for the Somerville Journal expanding on the organization's goals. He's lived in Somerville for four years and in Massachusetts for eight. Matthew, thank you very much for joining us. Hi, thanks for having me. So Matthew, I wanted to start with you. When you hear the words defund the police or when you say them, what does that mean to you? So to me, that means, you know, reallocating money away from police and using it to provide for people's basic needs. Um, when there are fewer police or when there's less money being spent on police and towards those life effect from services, uh, people are less likely to commit, to commit crimes to begin with. So it really means, you know, investing in services and programs that we know keep people safe, like, you know, housing, education, health care, and other crucial public services, uh, because, you know, policing has been proven over time to be a very violent institution. So, yeah, it's important to consider that police aren't really spending their time doing the stuff that, you know, we see them doing in movies. It's a lot of times just doing stuff that ends up harming working class people. So in some of the um, things that you've written and um, things that you've testified um, at the city council, and, and again here, you're really kind of talking about really getting rid of the police altogether. Would you say that that is your ideal scenario that you're looking at? Long term, sure, but that's not going to happen over the next year or two. Uh, like our goals for the immediate future are to make sure that the police budget does not get higher. So we want to make sure that there are no police officers, no additional police officers added. And then as cops retire that, you know, we just kind of continue to reduce the scope of policing in general. So over the very long term, yeah, but not in the next year or two. So I think when a lot of people here defund the police, um, they're thinking that ultimately you are going to be abolishing the police altogether. And it leaves a lot of people, especially people who did not grow up afraid of the police or have not had negative experiences with the police. The first thing that they think about is, well, if I dial 911, you know, who's going to answer the phone? Mm -hmm. So how, you know, so, so in your world, is there a 911? And if so, who answers the phone? So what we have to keep in mind is that Somerville is like not a terribly dangerous city. Uh, there hasn't been a murder here in years. Um, and so you're already like starting from a place of like, that's not really a common issue really. Like we're not, the average person isn't dialing 911 every day. Um, so what we're trying to do is really come up with more creative solutions. Like the majority of the problems that we face, even when people do not dial 911, don't require somebody with a gun and handcuffs to show up. And so that's really what something that we want to stress. And that when we're coming up with other solutions that you know are led by the community, that are you know people who 
are you know trained to respond with to everything with violence then we could like have another you know institution that like does that can respond to crises but not necessarily with violence all the time so um you we could definitely have like a rapid response thing but uh when we change the way that we fund our cities, you won't find yourself in those dangerous situations where you're not even having to dial 911. And as you can currently see in some of the place that is uh, very safe, the average person isn't calling 911 very often. We don't have a lot of violent crime already. That's because in some of it, we're lucky compared to a lot of other communities in this country. Right, but at that moment when you are dialing 911, it mm -hmm. really matters. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, so, so, so I mean, I guess you know, let's let's come back to that. But I think that's the the biggest fear. And you're right that Somerville isn't like a lot of other communities, but you know, but there is definitely crime, and there are people who experience that. And that's something that you know I've heard about from you know some other parts of the city where there is more crime. Absolutely. And I'm and I'm wondering, Ben, would you mind you know when when people say defund the police, what do you hear? Oh, I think I hear um, several different things, but at, ultimately at the end, it is that there is a zero police budget and, um, and you know, that just leads to a lot of other questions um, in my mind. Like what? Well, for one, um, who does respond to these calls and, um, you know, what about items like state and federal minimums for, uh, for safety? Um, you know, there are requirements just in general. Um, you know, I believe in reimagining policing. Um, I think that there is um, a role for policing. Um, I grew up in Somerville. I grew up in Somerville my whole life. Um, I know very well, um, you know, Somerville is a safe place now, not a safe place when I grew up. Um, I grew up in the generation of race riots and everything else. Um, so, um, you know, policing is, is different now compared to then, but it is, you know, there's times change. And, you know, we're thinking short term, not long term here. That's right. Well, and Somerville has become more affluent over time. And interestingly enough, I personally think that that um, crime shifts from, you know, um, from from outside of your house crime to white collar crime, <laughs> you know, doesn't necessarily require the, the, the cops with guns as the detectives with um, computers to, to solve those crimes. So things, things definitely have shifted there. Um, so, I mean, I guess it, it, a lot of the issue is what have you personally experienced in, in terms of police? And I was wondering, you know, Matthew, could you share, you know, have you had, you know, what is kind of the range of experiences that you've had with the police? You know, have you had positive experiences, negative experiences, and kind of under what circumstances? And how does some of you, you've lived in Somerville for a few years, so, you know, you've lived other places. How does it compare in Somerville to other places that you've lived? Okay, so... I can think of you know two examples uh, related to like my own experience, like just throughout my life experience with uh, policing. One is you know uh, a friend of the family who uh, is currently doing time in prison, uh, and what I want to stress is that like when people are you know committing crimes like we have to like have empathy for these people like that doesn't come out of nowhere. That's somebody who you know has had their basic needs in life are being met. So, you know, they are they was going to like, you know, extreme um, resorts to like provide for themselves. So the example I, I thought of was, you know, somebody who I know who was doing time in prison because of uh, a robbery. So this is somebody who I knew was poor uh, and was just like, you know, poor their whole life and decided that they were gonna steal from somebody in order to like, you know, just get some basic money like provide for his family. And in the process of doing that, he ended up like becoming violent and so like ended up assaulting the person who like, he was stealing from and that situation where if he had just like been like guaranteed like a job and like a home and like food that would have never really happened like that, that, that other person who got assaulted would have you know not been injured um i can also think of like another situation where you know in my home uh somebody like tried to um steal a car from our backyard <laughs> and that situation where like um I think so one of my older family members like, like my aunt decided to call the police in that situation it was like very late at night and that's that's a situation where like I can still empathize with the person who like tried to steal a car because that's a situation where 
they just desperately like this was again it was a working class neighborhood this was before I moved to Massachusetts which was in the Bronx and this is somebody who did that yeah just didn't really have much he grew up with, with very little and was desperate for anything they could find to like make some money for themselves and this is something that they decided to do I do, obviously I don't condone like breaking into somebody's house and stealing their car uh but that again no one's born you know as a criminal like that the world turns people into criminals when they when they don't have their basic you know needs met uh as far as Somerville in particular um yeah. I would point to things like so like last summer uh we had a so there was a city council hearing where like lots of people called in and FIFA and SPD like help organize that where we asked lots of people to call in and I know that you know there are people who live in Somerville who have been brutalized by police um and you know people who like whether it be at the state pride parade or you know people who you know were like pepper sprayed um like like you know take speaking specifically of the incident in which you know a person with handcuffs was pepper sprayed by police so I mean Somerville is definitely not an exception to you know excesses in police violence but even when the police are following all the laws and like are doing their job like as they're supposed to like that's still a problem and that's what i mean when i get at is like the, the structure and like the law that police are required to follow those are the things that harm working class people it's not just the extreme cases of a person being brutalized and i think you make a very great case about we have um started treating public health, certainly mental health issues as criminal issues. I mean, that started back when Reagan closed down a lot of mental health hospitals and literally threw these people on the streets and we have not been funding that. But having said that, there are gangs and we can go back to Irish gangs in Somerville. And, you know, I mean, there, there, there have always been people in various communities, you know, around the country, also in Somerville, et cetera, who I'm not sure that, that, that social services is going to completely solve that problem. And they all have to be done, you know, at the same time. I mean, I guess, you know, coming back to you, um, Benjamin, how have you seen the police evolve since you grew up in Somerville and you have that lifelong experience. Yeah, I mean, you know, growing up, I, you know, uh, my family and I were one of the original um, people of color living in the city. I mean, I grew up here and went to Winter Hill School and literally my sisters and I were the only uh, people of color. And, you know, we had, you know, rocks thrown through our window and the police would do nothing and say, you know, well, you didn't see nobody instead of opening investigations to, you know, now today or not today, literally, but, you know, to the police literally working with the Welcome Project to, you know, to talk with immigrants and tell them about what it means to be a sanctuary city, to um, the police running fundraisers, to, um, you know, being able to work closely with, you know, with police on, on a host of issues, including trainings and other things that they're looking to develop. So, you know, I think um, one of the things that we do talk about, you know, and that we don't necessarily fully talk about is, um, you know, I've seen the range here in, here in the city. I've seen the changes. I've seen a lot of the work, um, you know, that's happened. I mean, we talk about crime, but we tend to forget that last year there was a shooting in the Mystic Projects, um, you know, that required cops. Um, you know, there, you know, there are, there was an, you know, there have been other incidences, that, um, you know, throughout time. Somerville is a safe city, but it's not necessarily a place where all of a sudden you're going to get rid of policing. And, you know, and that's sort of the, the brunt of this. There's still crime in Somerville. That's right. And I mean, I have to say people, you know, my own personal experiences, you know, Ben, I've, I've had a range of experiences, but one time I was attacked um, by a guy in my apartment building. It wasn't here in Somerville, but, you know, my first thought was to call 911 um, because I you know, because because the guy was still out there. <laughs> and I wanted the cops to go catch him and make sure that, you know, he didn't come back or hurt me or anybody else and, and so forth. And I noticed that on the city website, there's an event coming up in May that talks about women's safety. And I think it's, you know, kind of in the context of all that we're doing here. So it kind of makes me wonder, and I'd love to hear from both of you about this, is the problem who we're recruiting? Is it 
you know, the people who apply for the jobs, um, you know, like um, police officers in Massachusetts can be hired from anywhere in the state to come work in Somerville. Do we need to have people who live in Somerville be cops? Is it possible to do that? Um, you know, would, you know, do mental health professionals want to be the people that go instead of cops or do they want the cops as backup? I mean, it just seems to me that that simply saying we're going to send social workers out, social workers can be racists. I mean, that doesn't necessarily even mean that we're going to give people the help that they need. So, you know, Matthew, from your perspective, do you think it's possible to hire local Somervillians to be police officers, maybe tamp down on the military equipment that they have and still have a police force? Or is that just off the table for you? So there are a number of things that were just said by the both of you that I would like to respond to before I get to that point. Um, on the topic of Irish gangs that we were talking about before, um, so there's a very common misconception that there are some people in the world are just bad. And that's a really important thing that I want to that dispel that myth. No one is born bad and no one is born a criminal. We, people decide what a crime is. That is a social construction. Nothing is a naturally like a, a criminal act. We decide um, what is going to be a crime, what's not going to be a crime. We live in a world where a small group of very wealthy people decide who, what is legal and what is illegal. You talked about um, white collar crime earlier, but most of that like white collar crime generally doesn't get investigated. It generally doesn't get prosecuted. If it does get prosecuted, it's going to be um, a slap on the wrist. That's because the people who are writing the laws are the same people who are committing the crimes. There are lots of really hor horrible things that corporations do that people who work in, you know, who are CEOs who are running like major corporations who that think that they do that are very, very, very bad, but are not illegal because again, they are the ones who are writing the laws. So when you talk about like things like Irish gangs, like that's a situation where those are products of people who are alienated by society, the people who are I'm not necessarily saying like, you know, um, sets like a social worker, something sim simple like that would be able to solve them. But th those are generally things that are related to economics. So these are, in many cases, families that are in are trying to take care of each other because they know that we live in a world where our country, where our government does not make sure that everyone's having the basic needs met. So that's why people will create a thing like a gang in order to make sure that their family gets protected. Now, there are definitely problems there where they, they might use unnecessary violence at times, but they, again, that's because there are people who have slipped through the cracks that are not getting their basic needs met. So that's why that happens. Um, the other thing I want to talk about, so you talk about a situation in which, you know, you were attacked by a guy and you were scared by that. That's totally understandable. Um, and another thing I want to talk about, like, with, with, with relation to, um, you know, police responding to um, violence, like, that may, like, be affecting women in particular. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is that currently in the United States, the percentage of women in prison is rising very, very high compared to very, very quickly compared to the rate of men in prison, prison. And then if you look at those particular women in prison, a lot of them are survivors of domestic violence. Um, so police are generally not taking those crimes very seriously. And women who, if you were to fight back against that guy who attacked you, you would have been more likely to go to prison than the guy would have. That's a very common thing. So if you look at people such as Marissa Alexander, very famous case, this is a woman in Florida. She was a survivor of domestic abuse. Um, she had a gun. This is Florida where they have a standard ground law, same law that was used to protect George Zimmerman when he killed Trayvon Martin. She decided right. to use the gun in her um, defense, and she was the one who went to jail, not her abusive boyfriend. So no, it's a crime. It's it's that situation is absolutely a crime. I completely that's, that's, agree with you. But what far, that makes me far more but, common than what, what that makes me want though is that makes me want to have more women on the police force. It doesn't make me want to not okay, have so a police why, force. Why, another thing about that. I, I still haven't answered your question, Marielle, by the way. Like, I, there, there are so many misconceptions flying all around this conversation that I really want to take the time to dispel. So I know I'm speaking a lot is because there are an extremely high amount of misconceptions. So you talk about more women on the force, for instance. Generally, what you see happening is when, when, when there are women on the force, you see things like there was a case in which a woman, a homeless woman, uh, 
had was like cavity searched by another woman. So she was on her period and literally pulled her tampon out. And that's something that they feel more comfortable doing because they have a women officers on the force. So what you end up happen, seeing happen is by having more women police officers that actually give the state more power to be harm more harmful towards women. You see cases where there were women prisons that like had, you know, fewer weapons. And then you have like women guards saying, oh, we want as just as many weapons as the as the men's prison have, which is basically giving them ex an excuse to brutalize women even more. Um, and in the cases a lot about the shooting and the mystics. So I, I want to bring get back to that topic as well that Ben brought up. So yeah. he, he said you're you're about, raising all kinds of great, I, great I know, points, I, I, Matthew. I, I, you both and just points that in, were, to me were like had some very, very fundamental misconceptions. And I really need to break those down because I don't yeah. want the audience to, to watch this conversation and go off and like have the same misconceptions. I don't want I want to go back just in fairness to, um, to to give Ben a chance to to respond to some of the things that you've okay that you've mentioned there? Well, I mean, one, as somebody who lived during the Irish gang wars and literally had been jumped, I was glad that the, there were police there. And, you know, and, and that comes down, you know, that comes down to the fact that, yeah, there were social economics. I knew both sides. I went to school with the kid, with the very kids who started the Irish gangs. I knew them. I knew them very well. Unfortunately, I knew one, you know, the one who ended up dying and, you know, being killed by his own friends and having the police investigate and having the police, um, you know, do the arrest and everything else. So there's always been a, a place for policing, you know, in the city. The other side, too, that we're that we're really not talking about or that Matthew keeps alluding to, but not necessarily, you know, um, pointing to there's a root cause of all these issues. And what the root cause is, is not the police. It's the laws that are inciting them. It's a culture that allows the policing to be the way that they are. And until, and no matter what we do, if we get rid of police, we're still gonna have some sort of form of, of enforcement that's gonna protect us in some form. And unless we actually change the, not just the culture within, the, within that enforcement, but we actually change the culture that creates the laws, we're still gonna be stuck in the same thing. All we continue to do is put band-aids on a system that doesn't need band-aids, but needs to actually be completely broken and redefined. And ben, that's ben, the way we can get that. What do you, Ben? What do you think about the civilian review process that the city is going through? Like how the city of Somerville is responding to this, setting that up. Do you have any thoughts on yeah, what I mean, that should look like? I was originally part of you know the group that was that you know the councils were talking to um, about it. I think it's a it's a damn shame that um, it's it hasn't reached the most uh, impacted people to be part of those discussions. Um, you know, because again, as you've seen in this discussion, it's not just people of color that have to deal with policing, it's women. Um, you know, we haven't talked about the fact, you know, women, uh, battered women in any given way and domestic violence in those situations. Um, I'm no expert in those situations. I have talked to, um, you know, respond and members over there about, about policing. And, you know, there's a host of things there. Um, my personal belief is, is that the civilian review board, as long as it has teeth in that, as long as there is a um, power in the sense that one, it shouldn't be political, two, it needs to, there needs to be a guaranteed uh, in perpetuity of funding because what we've seen in cities like Cambridge is they have these things, they don't fund them. Um, yeah. And we've seen that in Somerville as well for other departments and other things like that. And then ultimately, you know, we need to make sure that the most impacted people are the people that are there. And then finally, we, we can't just look at an incident. We need to look at training. We need to look at policies. We need to do a deep dive. Um, you know, policing, the one thing, we're, you know, we haven't talked about really is the educational level. When we look at Europe and, and how they do policing, two to four years degrees, you know, training right. for years and everything else versus you know, the three to six months that we do here, where in so many states that's well above compared to so many states that are having policing problems, where I've heard, you know, some are weak course. Right. So, you know, so we need to, you know, we should be looking at a full venue of options here. Um, yeah. I also believe that, and, and I agree with Matthew, we need to get rid of the older police, uh, the policemen. The way we need to do that is by offering early retirement, get rid of them early. And, yeah. let's, and let's continue to add people, you know, younger, more progressive police officers who are being trained and, you know, we're training for two to four years. 
while they're doing that training, we're, you know, we're working with them on, on a degree program and that, you know, and that we're really building out a system where people are actually trained, they're competent, they're, you know, they're, they're ready to go. It's not just a six month course that people take and, you know, here you go and a civil service test, which literally from, I've heard cops say one of the questions on the test is, could you kill somebody if you needed to? <laughs> we should not That's be asking crazy. questions yeah. like that. Yeah. Now, and I'm sorry to jump in, but we only have a little bit of time. Matthew, I'd love to get your thoughts on the, um, the civilian review process. What would you like to see? Thanks. So I'm going to do what I did last time and address a few misconceptions that already have come up first. So um, on the issue of diverse cops, I don't want them. Uh, I don't want cops who are from who are local either, because statistically that does not make a difference. They have tried this in many cities. It does not make a difference. Um, ben said, said something earlier about us wanting to get rid of all cops right away. I have never said that. Defund SB has never said that we're trying to get rid of all cops immediately. That is not one of our demands. Um, social workers, we have never asked to replace cops with social workers. That is not one of our demands. We do not want to do that because we know that social workers can be racist and they can destroy families. So that is not one of our demands. If you heard somebody say that they were not with defund SPD. Um, another thing that Ben said that I agree with is the topic about, you know, the laws being bad and like they are the root cause. I agree with you. And in the meantime, while the laws are bad, we don't want people enforcing bad laws. So we, by you actually make things safer when you reduce the amount of things police are doing because there are so many bad laws. You have laws that are criminalizing poverty. So if you have more cops out there that are out that are, you know, arresting people for like things like loitering or things like you know having drugs on them. Well we have okay. laws that are criminal. Okay. Laws. Yeah, we we are, we are just absolutely at the very, very end of time. So unfortunately we aren't going to be able to talk um, about the civilian review board. Um, but just going very, very quickly, is defund the police the best slogan for what it is that we're trying to do? Ben, if you could pick a different slogan, what would it be? Reimagining police is really what, what, what I believe needs to happen. Okay, and how about you, Matthew? Defund police is the best slogan because it is clear that we want to reduce the scope of police. People have been reimagining police since police were created and we're looking at the mess that we're in right now. So reimagining police is intentionally vague. We want to defund because it is obvious and we want to refund the other areas that have been systematically cut for decades. Okay, I wanna thank both of you. We're absolutely out of time. Thanks to you both for sharing your thoughts and expertise on this very important topic. Thank you. Thanks for having me.